starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first part of our now annual feature for the food and drink sector in collaboration with the Food and Drink Exporters Association and the Food and Drink Federation. Today's webinar is on setting the right price when selling overseas, which is certainly a hot topic given the fall in value of the pound and the impact that is already having. My name is William Barnes-Graham and I'm the Digital Content Manager at Open to Export. We are a government-supported online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, Ask the Experts forum and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentexport.com. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. We'll get to as many of these as we can at the end. With the questions, we will also be reposting these onto the forum following the webinar. We will then reassign these questions to a user account should you be registered to our site. This will allow you to get answers straight into your inbox within a few days. We don't typically share the slides from the presentation, but we will be recording today's session and sending you a copy of it by the end of the week as well as uploading it to our website where you can view this webinar and all of our previous webinars on demand as many times as you like. We have three great speakers today. Given an introduction on how to approach pricing internationally will be Susan Morley, who's been involved in international trade for over 35 years and has practical experience covering everything from freight forwarding to export licenses to tax. Elsa Fairbanks from Food and Drink Exportees We'll then be giving sector-specific advice, drawing on decades of experience as a consultant and advisor in, the food, in food and drinks exports. And finally, we'll have Katie Birrell, who will be sharing her experiences exporting at Nairn's Oat Cakes, who sell oat cakes, crackers, biscuits, and oat-based snacks and gluten-free products to many international markets from Scotland. So it's a cracking lineup, I'm sure you'll agree. But before we go into the presentations, I'd just like to take a quick straw poll about what I'm sure will be a key feature of today's presentations. Uh, this being the fall of the value of a pound. So I'm just going to launch that now. So the question I'm going to ask is, has the impact of a weakening pound already affected your approach to international pricing and long time pro price quotations? The options are yes, no, or not sure. So I'll give you a, a few seconds to, to answer that. This is already shaping to be quite an interesting poll. Um, so I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. So not surprisingly, it's, it's obviously having quite an impact, quite a lot of uncertainty as well. Um, and not too many people saying it's gonna have no impact. So it's quite a big topic as, a, as I'm sure most people would be expecting. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Susan, who will be starting today's session. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm going to speak about how you understand the export pricing from the basis of preparing a quotation. Next slide, please. So I would suggest seven main headings in addition to the cost of the goods. And those headings are going to cover product approval, packaging, documentation, transport, government fees, inco terms and insurance. Now those, I would suggest those seven headings all apply to every export, no matter what type of food, drink or other product you are attempting to export. And we need to work them into any quotation that we intend to give a would-be importer. Next slide, please. So to start with product approval, what does this mean? Well, every country who allows imports of any kind has a set of regulations, indeed many sets of regulations, which say what sort of goods will be allowed into their country. Much of this is to do with consumer protection. Uh, the exploding televisions was a, a very real uh, problem some years ago because they were very poorly made uh, and people plugged them in and they went bang. This is because they weren't made to suit the current in the country that they were being exported to. But it's not just the obvious such as that. 
It's things like jewellery. There are different metals in jewellery, some of which are considered by some countries to be poisonous, or at least give, to give an allergic reaction. So you need chemical analysis. And then there are the food and drink items specifically, which may contain ingredients, which we might think of as perfectly acceptable, but some countries consider not to be, and will ask you to prove that your goods don't contain those ingredients. So the first thing to do is to find out what the regulations are for your particular product. This can be quite tricky, but it is possible to do, uh, and you can get most of the information online if you are prepared to have a bit of a search. Having found the regulations, your product is then going to have to be tested or analysed by a body uh, who is acceptable to the importing government, not just your local test uh, house or someone like that that you might choose. You've got to use someone that the importing government will find acceptable. In some cases, they will only find companies and test houses acceptable within their own country in which case you have to do a special shipment of samples for testing purposes to the testing house, who will then uh, subject them to whatever analysis is necessary and produce a report before you are allowed to consider exporting those products. And then every time you export those products, you would need to include a copy of that test analysis uh, and their approval of that test. Should you change your product in any way, of course, you've got to go through it all again because the analysis will be different. So we have to be careful that we don't think having gone through this process once, we can forget about it. We can't. We have to go back at any time any of the product ingredients is changed. Having approved the product, you may get a certificate. It could simply be called an approval certificate. It could be a certificate of conformity or a certificate of analysis, which actually lists the chemical analysis. You've got to be careful with this if you're guarding your recipe quite closely uh, and you don't want anyone to read the analysis and take your recipe and produce it locally. So there is a degree of uh, concern over who these certificates get sent to, but importing customs will certainly need to see them. You may be required following this testing to actually have specific marking and registration numbers or words placed on the labelling of your product. The cost of doing all of this is time, most assuredly your time, but not a, sometimes it's no cost, you no know, fees to pay, but other times there are huge fees to pay, uh, just depending what the kind of testing is. And it can take days or it can take months at the worst to get this approval. So you need to know well beforehand what you need to meet in regards to regulations and to get it done before you get caught and your goods are stuck in customs. Next slide, please. With packaging, people tend to think that's very easy, just get a brown box and we'll be done. But actually, I would ask, why are you packing it? What regulations are you meeting for your product? Does it need particular packaging? What your country of dispatch and your country of import would want with it? and what happens in between, the transit, the journey. So that will depend on the method of transport. Air has different requirements to sea, which is different to road. And couriers are air, by the way. So you need to concern yourself with how robust your packaging is, how well packed inside the outer packaging uh, your product is, and then what conditions your product is going to meet along the way. Will it suffer adverse weather? Not all airports and ports have their cargo kept indoors at all times. Sometimes they'll be on the tarmac or beside the vessel and it will rain or snow. What will happen to your packaging in those instances? What labels do you need to put on the outside? Those in marketing who would like to put uh, excellent pictures and words about their product, this is very fine, but if you do it on the outer box, you're simply encouraging a criminal to consider its worth and steal it. Much better to be as plain as possible and have only numbers, not proper descriptions of your product. There is also security to consider in the modern day. How tamper-proof is your outer box? How evident would it be if it was tampered with? You should be 
be concerned about this and taking efforts, which of course cost money, to make sure that you're using the right things. Next slide, please. Having decided where to go and what you want to send, there will then be fees for various sorts of documents, and these will vary country by country. There isn't a standard, and not even the shape of the forms is standardized. Now, there's lots of different certificates, uh, and you can have things certified. This means you've gone to a chamber of commerce in this country, and they produce a stamp because they check your paperwork, not for the content so much as whether they think you're a real company and what you've put down is about real goods they will charge you for that certification and it is demanded by many importing countries. Some countries don't even think the Chamber of Commerce is sufficiently uh, separate from the exporters to be trusted, so they want a second set of stamping which is legalization, which is done by the embassy in your exporting country for the importing country. Uh, you may well end up with stamps and very pretty sort of postage stamps applied to the back of your documents. This will cost you too. There are fees. Uh, at worst, one or two of the embassies charge a percentage of the value of the goods to be shipped, rather than just a standardized fee. Your goods may end up subject to hazardous declarations. That may be surprising to some. Uh, with food and drink, but some substances when mixed with others can be hazardous and can perhaps taint others uh, with smell or flavor or something nasty, sticky, or react chemically with other things. So it's, it's not beyond thinking that your product might taint something else. You will be charged for customs entries, whether you use a courier or a freight forwarder, because when leaving the European Union, all goods are subject to going through customs, and when entering any other country, they'll be subject to customs outside of the European Union, so you may be charged fees at both ends. And export licenses and import licenses, which can be related to approval, may also have to be obtained and may have a small fee attached to them. So you need quite a few pieces of paper before you can leave the country. Next slide, please. We then come to transport costs. Now these actually are not a single cost, there's lots of elements to them, some of which you can see on the slide there. But the important thing to note is they are all based on the weight, which is the packed weight, versus the packed volume of your product. So if you're, you get a freight rate expressed as $2 per kilo, what they actually mean is $2 per gross kilo or per volumetric kilo. Now, that catches a lot of people out because a lot of things are lighter than they are heavy, at which point you will get the volumetric kicking in. Uh, this applies to couriers too, and that means you can double or triple the price you thought you were getting because of the weight. So understanding how to work out your volumetric kilos is important. With sea freight, we have cubic meters um, to work out. Also, the price has to be either expressed as what is, what's included in it. Is it all inclusive? Is it door to door? Is it landed price? And what do those terms mean? Because they mean different things to different people. In retail, landed price is used a lot, but that doesn't mean everyone understands the same elements are within that price. And when you quote your price, if you don't know what elements are within it, then there's plenty of space for misunderstanding and for nasty surprises. Next slide, please. Now, on top of all of these things, when you import goods outside of the European Union, there is import duty and some sort of tax, VAT, or it can be called GST, or many other names, which is a sort of VAT type tax, and special destination fees. These are to be added on to the cost of the goods and the freight. You can see on the slide the basic calculation, and I would stress this is the very most basic level of calculation, where you take the goods value, your complete freight costs, an insurance premium, and a duty percentage, which is a, the import duty tax, and that will give you the duty. You then have to add that on again in order to work out the other tax or taxes. In many countries, there may be only two, but a lot of countries have a variety of taxes to suit their own situation. 
Brazil is particularly heavy in taxes and I've known it the actual taxes add up to more than 150 percent of the value of the product so you have to work this out in advance because otherwise you may be making your product uh, unsuitable for the market because it's just too expensive or you may be hit by hidden costs these costs which shouldn't be hidden which you weren't expecting you can have other costs added on which are factors affecting the duty price such as anti-dumping or countervailing these are additional duties on top of the basic duty and can be 70 or 80 percent themselves so it's wise to know if your product is being affected by these and these are more um, qu these are quickly added duties they're not standard duties and they can be added or taken away overnight so you have to keep a good eye on the marketplace origin can affect the rate of duty by giving it a discount these are what I would describe as mates rates where different countries sign up to agreements you'll have heard free trade agreement mentioned I'm sure on the news many times recently and these are free trade agreements which is a very poor name for them really because they're not free but they will reduce import duty based on the origin of the products so if you uh, qualify for one of those agreements then you'll need a piece of paper to prove so and you may get your products into a market at much reduced cost next slide please now having spoken of all those diff different cost elements is how do we mention that in a contract well the easy answer are inco terms these are shorthand terms you don't have to write more than a line or maybe two into your contract to get pages of actual terminology added on which is hidden behind them because they are the shorthand they're legally binding in every country and can be found in almost every language so there isn't really an excuse for not being able to understand them there are currently 11 different terms uh, they what they detail is who is responsible for which part of the supply chain and who is going to be paying for which part of the supply chain so very important what they don't do is actually say what your sales terms are 90 days, 100 days, 30 days from whatever nor do they actually say what your price will be they merely say what is included within the price you are quoting the first inco term is X works and this term is used often for price lists but it's not actually much use if the seller intends to be the exporter it is really only any good if the seller is selling the goods to someone in their home country who is then going to export them the final term on the list is DDP delivered duty paid which some people feel is a landed cost but this one makes the seller responsible for everything door to door including the foreign taxes and that's one of the most expensive ways and legally the most risky way to sell a product because you have to place yourself in the country of import as a company and you have to be able to manage all of the legalities concerning that import as if you had a company in the country so it's very much not recommended unless you really know what you're doing instead of those two terms the most popular should be free carrier FCA or delivered at place DAP free carrier makes you the exporter so we know legally what risks are being taken and DAP means you'll pay for delivery door-to-door -door excluding the import duty and import taxes that will be the responsibility of the importer so is a much better way of arranging things if you don't have a company in the country of import next slide please insurance is optional but what would you insure for if you chose to do so would it be non-delivery or damage or non-payment disruption due to terrorism or war sanctions which prevent you suddenly exporting to a particular country think of Russia when uh, they went into Ukraine all of a sudden sanctions came on overnight uh, food and drink couldn't move to Russia for example uh, exchange rate risks or the risks of Brexit would you want your insurance per shipment or as an annual policy which is possible and then the question is who's going to buy it the exporter or the importer and where are they going to get it from would they go to a commercial insurance company would they use the freight or courier agents insurance scheme or would they use a government scheme for export finance either are any of those are possible 
but what I would urge you to consider is what are you insuring for? It's not a global policy that sort of covers everything because that would be very expensive. Pick your risks according to your markets and according to your needs and then get insurance to match that risk, uh, not in general. Now all that I've spoken about so far uh, today uh, would be affected by Brexit, but under Brexit and the Great Repeal Bill, all of the laws that are governing the items I've spoken of will be put into UK law and therefore nothing will change until after Brexit when the UK may choose to alter things to its own benefit. So no need to panic just yet. Uh, that's the end of my presentation, so back to you Will, thank you. Thank you Susan, a uh, really great overview to pricing and uh, all the things that come with it and um, something which will hopefully be relevant to, to all sectors. And so now going on to Elsa's presentation because Elsa will be talking about the food and drink sector specifically. So over to you, Elsa. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, thank you, Susan, for such a comprehensive presentation and such sound advice, which hopefully myself and when Katie talks, we can bring into the specific context of the food and drink sector. So next slide, please. Just briefly to explain, food and drink exportees provides international market development programs for food and drink businesses. and Perhaps particularly relevant to today, we're the management team behind the Food and Drink Exporters Association, which is a not-for-profit trade association of over 150 members of all levels of export experience, including some of the UK's most successful food and drink exporters. The food and drink sector is one of our most successful export sectors. This is often not recognised by government, and you'll see at the bottom where we say we lobby government. This is a message we're trying to get across very strongly at the moment. We work closely with DEFRA and of course DIT as well. Next slide please. So <laughs> the big question, export pricing, what does it mean for UK food and drink exporters post Brexit? Obviously at this point in time we cannot say, but as your poll well showed, it is causing concern and people are having to be very aware of you know, the future, both the near future and the long-term future. Is it going to present challenges? Almost certainly. Opportunities? Again, almost certainly. And hopefully we can help you to think of some of the areas that you might want to be planning for. Next slide, please. Just some of our advice to any business would apply for most businesses, not just the food and drink sector, as Brexit gets ever closer, it will be really important to have a balanced portfolio of customers. The food and drink sector is supplying the EU to a large extent. Over 70% of our food and drink exports go to the EU. But we now need to start looking beyond the EU, thinking about the skills that we will need to supply some of the markets where the demands are greater, as Susan has mentioned, and also hope that the EU will remain as easy as it is at the moment to trade with. This is absolutely something that we're lobbying very strongly for. It's never been more important to strengthen your international relationships. I've just come back from Seattle, the large trade fair in Paris, and most of our international customers are quite bewildered by the Brexit situation. And it is really important to reassure them that it is business as usual, particularly for our European customers, but the wider sort of importing community at all. And you, know, you will have to build on your export skills. It is more difficult to export outside the EU at the moment, and it may well be that those skills will have to come into play in the EU, although a lot of people are crossing fingers and lobbying hard to hope that won't be the case. Next slide, please. So when you set your export price, this is a conversation you need to have internally. When is the right time to quote your price? Almost certainly a potential customer, particularly at a trade show, will say, well, let me have your price, please. But as Susan has illustrated so well, it is a folly to provide your price till you have done your homework. And you really do need to look at what you need to take into account. I won't repeat 
in detail what Susan said, but we will cover this in another slide, and I'm sure Katie will cover some of these issues as well. And the fundamental question to ask is how much control do you want to have? And when we look at routes to market briefly, that's one element, and all the issues around currency. So those are debates that you constantly need to be having within your company. Right, please. Vital to any export pricing plan is to do your research. This applies across the whole issue of identifying export markets and customers, but never more important than when fixing a, fixing a price. You need to understand your market, how it works, what the supply chain is, and I'll cover that briefly in a slide shortly. You need to check out your competition. And that is increasingly easy because with online grocery shopping, at a click of a mouse, you can enter the world of grocery shopping in any, well, any country in the world, but most countries in the world. But also, I really recommend that you visit your main export markets so that you can understand what's happening in the market, what people are buying, how retailers are positioning products, or if you're in the food service catering sector, how that is, the pricing structure works on that. You know, understanding your market entry costs, you know, the costs that you can't avoid, as well as the costs that you may want to account for to build your markets. Next slide, please. So, uh, to get it right, perhaps the only message I'd like to leave from this is, don't be afraid to ask questions. Your customers, if they want to buy your products, will be happy to answer questions that you have because it is in their interest so everybody gets it right from the start. You do need to cover all the costs, extra production costs, export labeling is the bane of most production managers. So I'm sure that they will want to ensure that if you're planning a shipment to a new export market, every cost is covered market compliance, product registration costs can vary enormously depending on the market. Sort of markets like India and China, which we'll all be looking at in the future, require quite significant product registration processes. Susan's already mentioned INCO terms and any documentation. And last but not least, managing your risk. Any commercial transi transaction has risk associated to it. Of course, the further you get away from your UK market, there are more risks. And whilst not, it's a topic in itself, export finance is something you may be wanting to think about. Insurance, both insurance of goods and insurance of debts. Currency management, particularly at the moment, is something that you may want to investigate with your bank or specialist currency management organisations. And of course, market development. Uh, the competitive arena of food and drink is such that you really do need to build something into your costs to help you get your products off the shelf and in the shopping baskets of your consumers. And again, this is probably a topic for another webinar, but something to have at the back of your mind when you're fixing your price and before you actually give your customer that export price. Next slide, please. I mentioned the supply chain, and the, the point where you'll be quoting depends perhaps on your route to market. You may choose to work for a UK-based export consolidator who will be very happy to have an X-Works price, and they will manage the rest of the costings that are required, export labelling, working through the supply chain and shipments. If you're working with a local importer distributor, you will need to understand what their margins are and what those margins cover, local distribution, local promotion. You may choose to work with a local agent to help you target direct customers, retailers or food service, or have an in-market consultant to help you plan a market entry strategy for a particular market. Next slide, please. So here's just one calculation. I've recently been to Canada, so this is fresh in my mind. Looking at supplying a product, which is, this, is a, this was a, based on a snack product, to a mainstream retailer in Canada. 
So starting, as one has to, with the retail selling price, which in this case was five Canadian dollars 49 cents. In Canada, taxes get added on after you've arrived at the cash point, which can sometimes be a bit disconcerting when you think you're paying a certain price for a product. And then the different taxes that Susan mentioned before need to be added on. You then need to understand the margin that your retailer is making. In this case, it was 35%. And over the years, I've noticed there's much more transparency. If you ask a question of a retailer, nowadays, they are, I find, quite happy to share that margin. You need to understand the level of duty. In this case, this product had 11%. And I would strongly recommend that you ensure that you are using the right HS code, the code number that's used to calculate duty. Because this can vary quite dramatically in some markets. This was certainly the case in Canada, where just breakfast cereals, I noticed, there was a vast difference depending which HS code you use. So make sure you are using the right one. And then there was this extra 5% local tax to add on. The importer that was responsible for this project was working on a 30% margin. And that is something that you have to negotiate. And you need to clarify what, what you get for that 30%. A quick assumption here was a 10% on freight. But obviously, if it was a large order, you would want to make sure this was absolutely precisely calculated. And this happened to be the rate of exchange when I was doing this calculation. It's changing quickly at the moment, so a view may have to be taken on which exchange rate you and your customer are going to work on and have some discussions around that. Next slide, please. Talked about risk management, and you know it, it's a, a massive topic, but I would say always take out references, any customer that you're using. It may well be through your bank or a sort of credit control system. A lot of people that offer export insurance, financial insurance, are able to do this. Also talk to your fellow UK exporters. If you're supplying a customer in a market, there's a good chance there'll be another UK exporter working with that customer. We're certainly in the FDEA. That is an area where our members can share experiences with each other. Absolutely, implement strict export credit control procedures. It's easy to lose control quickly when the further away a product is. If a, an order is, a payment is becoming a week or two overdue, don't let it sort of just sit there. Get onto it as quickly as possible. Protect your commercial risks as much as you can. Understanding the different risks, commercial risks. This could include protecting your IP or you know, sort of the, the product, your pro areas that make your product yours. Political risk in this troubled world that we're living in is ever an issue, particularly as you get further out of the UK and Europe. And some countries have their own risks, which you can't always predict. You could, Susan mentioned Russia before. The sort of import ban on certain categories was perhaps something that, you know, came as a shock to a lot of people but you have to bear in mind that that might be happening to your product, particularly if it's a large contract that you're working on. Next slide, please. So, all I can say is that there are lots of people out there to help you, government departments, people like the FDA, and of course, my company, Food and Drink Exportees. And now I'll hand over to Katie, who I think will tell you how it, what it's really like out there being an export manager. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elsa. Just before um, I hand over to Katie, just a reminder to everyone that you can ask questions at any point using the control panel on the right-hand side. We've got some great speakers today, so if you have any questions, please do send them in. Uh, but for now, to share some experiences of being an exporter in this market, over to you, Katie. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Katie uh, Birrell, Export Sales Manager for Nair and Zolt Cakes. Um, for those of you that don't know the company, uh, we're based in Edinburgh, independent Scottish company. Uh, we've been around for quite a while, since about 1896. Uh, we were confounded by Baker John Nairn. Um, sorry, you could whiz on to the next slide actually, William, thank you. 
and we were a buyout from United Biscuits in 1996, so we've are in our current guise for, for 20 years, this is our 20th anniversary. And um, we are producer of oat cakes uh, primarily, um, as well as oat biscuits and oat snack products, um, and now a full range of gluten-free products, which is, is quite an area of strength for the business. So um, our vision really is to make the most delicious and natural and wholesome oat products to support a healthy lifestyle. So that's kind of really what we're all about. Right? Um, if you could pop on to the next slide, thanks William. So I mean in terms of of where we sell, very much UK uh, mainstream grocery, so we're in all the top uh, five major retail outlets here, as well as the kind of independent health food trade, as well as about food service. Um, in terms of international, about 10% of our sales are international, and we're in about 30 markets. Um, mainly, luckily I suppose for us, most of our markets are outside the, the EU, or most, most of our sort of major sales are outside that, and um, so that's helping us at the moment, I guess. But um, our top top ones are Ireland, which obviously is within the EU, but the, uh, the States and Canada, New Zealand, the Middle East is, is growing uh, in importance to us, and funnily enough, Cyprus punches kind of well above its weight in terms of size of, um, and population, but it's a very strong market for us. Go to the next slide, please. So obviously we're talking about getting the pricing right for export. I'm very conscious of repeating Elsa and Susan, but really everything that these that these guys said, we do put into practice. So um, there will be a bit of crossover. Um, but really the first question we ask ourselves when we're setting pricing is, is the market a strategic priority? Because if it's not, then we generally have a fairly standard export price, um, it's a kind of set percentage below UK wholesale, so we have some uh, standardisation with that. Um, but if it is a strategic market, then there are quite a few considerations that we um, that we take into account, and that that's kind of how we work it in practice. So in terms of what type of business you're quoting, what margins and costs you need to include, um, you know whether it's a you know local currency or sterling, should you line price your products, and then probably most importantly the competitive set pricing. So um, luckily for us, we have a fairly straightforward product. We don't have anything too contentious in our ingredients. So for us, it's fairly straightforward. We don't have too many limitations in what we have to consider in our price. Um, but I realize that some that some people that might be listening, might uh, that might be a bit more challenging for you. But I can really only talk from our experience. So on to the next slide, please. So in terms of what business you're quoting, of course, the most standard route to market importer distributor. Um, so lots of considerations, what their margin is, whether they then sell, for example, in the States, mainly there's um, sub-distributor margins to take into account. Uh, so there, there's quite a lot of elements to be included within that. Um, if you're quoting directly to a retailer, uh, then it's it's that's really useful because you can cut out that importer distributor margin. So one way to look at it is that you can get a better price on shelf. But counter to that, if you wanted then to develop uh, the market perhaps through local wholesalers to reach the independent trade, and you therefore needed an importer um, at some point down the road, then it's quite important to build in an importer margin that you keep. Um, when you're quoting to the retailer, because what can often happen is you then work, at, you know, there's two separate tiers within the market, which doesn't really work. So in order to keep your pricing consistent, then it's important you kind of look at the long-term strategy as well as the short-term and build both of those into, in, into your price structure. And thirdly, as Elsa said, agents, and they can be very useful in quite a lot of markets. And um, you know, we use them in some markets, uh, mainly in, in Europe actually. And they, you know, they, you have to build in their commission, which could be between anything between five and fifteen percent, depending on what they're doing for you. But it's important to build that into your your cost structure. On to the next one, please. So. 
obviously Elsa and Susan covered some of these and what costs to take into account, so I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but clearly logistics, that's a massive area, um, not just the freight, but depending on what your terms are, the documentation, duty charges, etc. Um, as we mentioned, importer and retailer margins, those do vary, although Elsa's quite right, between 30 and 35% is fairly standard. Um, and yes, and it is becoming much more transparent. We're certainly finding that as well, that uh, the cost structures right through the system are becoming much more uh, transparent between importers, uh, whereas it used to be very closely guarded secrets about, uh, about people's margins previously. We're not finding that as much now, so that, that makes it much easier for us. And um, broker fees, certainly in the States, uh, then if you're exporting there, then broker fees need to be taken into account. Quite often your importer will cover those, it can be anything between 4 and 6%, um, but uh, even if your, uh, your importer is taking, you know, covering those, then it's something to build into the margin because it will affect your, your end retail price. And similarly, labelling, uh, there's obviously lots of different ways to label. Um, yes, production never really liked labelling very much, so whether you're outsourcing it, there'll be cost added in there. Uh, we sometimes, uh, if legislation allows, then we will have our importer label products on arrival. Uh, in certain markets, that's obviously not allowed. The product has to arrive um, fully legal, for example, in China and many Far Eastern countries. Um, but uh, some markets closer to home will allow the product to be labelled on arrival. So uh, that's, that's an option to give a discount uh, uh, to your importer if they're able to handle that for you. So something to build into the, the cost base either way, but there's different ways to handle it. Um, and certainly trade and consumer promotional spend, uh, you know, it's obviously feasible to, uh, to give a dead net price or a net net price, uh, but often uh, building in some cover for listing fees or distributor trade programs. Uh, and similarly for, uh, you know, consumer promotional spend, that often comes back or as a, as a bill back or charge back to, to the supplier. So that's something that we, we take quite seriously in terms of budgeting um, the spend for each market. And that, that's quite an important one to factor in. On to the next one. Currency becoming uh, more and more of a challenge. Uh, we mainly invoice in sterling, uh, but uh, depending on certain markets, we do need to charge in local currency. So that, that's very much uh, an internal decision as to, to what, uh, what the parameters would be in terms of whether it's hedging currency or spot rates, etc. Then that's, that can be quite a challenging one, especially in today's climate. On to the next one. Um, line pricing, uh, for us, then we have different tiers within our pricing uh, for, for example, plain products or products with inclusions, but it can be very beneficial and I wouldn't be surprised uh, if, or, you know, if you hear from your importer that they would like to line price your products because for overseas markets, they often want to promote as a full brand uh, across all your products and across all your SKUs, uh, and they want to do that with, you know, with one line price. So that we often are asked for that. Um, where it's not feasible, then limiting to as few, uh, you know, groups of costs as you can, then that would that would help uh, your importer. But quite often, uh, we'll be asked if we can line price our products. On to the next one. And um, lastly, but certainly most importantly for us, is really looking at our competitive set. And certainly when it, the market is a strategic priority, then we want to make sure that we're in it for the long term and that our pricing is set accurately in the market and to give us the greatest benefit. Um, our first port of call is really to ask the importer an agent uh, or agent for a market review uh, for your category and kind of link to that understanding the competitive set for the market. And that can be quite a time consuming exercise for an importer and we almost use that as a as a gauge as to how interested, if it's a potential importer, then how interested they are in getting our business because um, it, it shows that they're committed to you, that they're committed to your brand, 
uh, if they're willing to spend the time to understand uh, that area of the market that you know for your products and the better they understand the market the better they understand the products that you're up against then the better they can sell your products so we almost use it as as a tool to to ensure that we've got engagement for the uh, from the potential importer and lastly, carrying out primary desk research, as Elsa said, online shopping is a great tool for us. So I've you know, noted their lob laws and countdown in New Zealand, and we use them frequently to just check up on pricing, check up on new products, uh, you know, make sure that we're up to speed with um, all the products that are in our competitive set. And it's really useful to be able to do that rather than um, you know, it's quite difficult to all jump on a plane, much as it would be great to be able to do that, but it's a more uh, frequent tool that we can use in order to, to make sure that we're up to speed with, with what's going on in the market. So that's really, a, that's on to the next slide, but that's really a kind of whistle-stop tour on pricing from me, but if, if anybody has any more specific questions, then I'm happy to try and answer them if I can. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you also to Susan and Elsa. Uh, Susan and Elsa for what was a really great overview of pricing in the sector. Some really great tips, and I'm really great to hear from someone who's going through it at the moment. At the end, um, a lot was covered there, and we've had a few questions come in. Um, so we'll, we'll open the floor to them now. But uh, as I say, if you want to ask a question, please use the control panel on the right-hand side, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, I mean, the first question. I'm going to ask uh, is following kind of the, the news stories about Tesco and um, and Marmite is Marmite now becoming too expensive for Tesco since since the change in currency. Is it worth exporters at the moment looking at overseas distributors who maybe previously wouldn't have been able to afford British products, um, kind of going back to these distributors and and trying to pitch to these distributors? Elsa, would you would you like to start on that? Um. I'm not totally clear what the question is, but I'm assuming that perhaps looking for new markets of products that might be more affordable. Is that what you understood from that, William? Um, more in terms of distributors. So kind of um, whereas previously a distributor might have seen just a British price and gone, it's, it's too much for us. Do you think that may change now? And is it worth going back to some distributors who previously wouldn't have bought your product? Perhaps using the UK selling price as a ga gauge as to whether it was right for them. Yes. And that's probably still a fairly useful guide. One of the tips I would give if somebody is pushing you in terms of what your pricing is, you could at least give an indication, well, in the UK, we're positioned in this sort of price area. So I still think doing more detailed homework is the way to deciding whether a local import or distributor is going to be right for you and whether the market's right for your prices. But no, that's for or not. Okay, well, we, we can we can always uh, come back to these questions afterwards on, on, on the forum. A um, uh, question here from Peter, which is, how do you best approach the challenge of movement guarantee for spirits of for ex for spirits for exporting? Uh, would, Susan, would you like to to answer that? Yes, the the guarantees for all types of movement as well as excise have become a particularly hot topic at the moment because until May this year they weren't particularly used except for excise and now they're used for everything. Um, now we need to get them. There are a variety of choices as to who can provide them. That has been made wider than it was before. It's not just a bank guarantee now. You can go to insurance companies uh, to acquire these guarantees and therefore negotiate the cost of them. What is most important about them is working out what the value is that you're supposed to be guaranteeing because it's easy to be sucked into guaranteeing far too much, far more than you're legally required to guarantee and therefore costing yourself more money. So my first uh, answer to that is a very careful working out of what it is in value terms you are actually being asked to guarantee uh, before then shopping around as to where you can get the cheapest version of that guarantee. Uh, thank That's you. That's really the answer. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, and we've had a question in from from Tom. Um, it's it's the big question we're obviously asking. He he asked, do you see international ex exports growing because of Brexit? Uh, Brexit, and um, is 
price and currency the only factor in, in whether this will happen or, or what other factors may there be? Um, Elsa, would you like to, to take to that? I think it's too early to say. Certainly Britain is high up the agenda for a lot of people, so for better or for worse, people are thinking about Britain as an exporting country, so hopefully we're pushing at an open door. Export will be important to us, so certainly to the food sector. I mean, most of the FDA members would say that export was a vital part of their sort of whole company sort of profitability at the moment. So we can only hope it will be and provide as much support as we can to make that happen. And you just if I might yeah. come in on that one as well, um, this is Susan. Uh, we have circumstances right now that we haven't had for years in this country in that because of Brexit we have three government departments out there in the world actually being our sales force. They're really focused on outside of Europe, opening markets, getting our foot in the door and selling the brand of the UK which should stand for quality uh, and sort of fairness, you know, all the usual UK things. We've not had that in years where a government has been so focused with all of their ministries on actually exporting and supporting our exporters. So I think we should try to take advantage of that and be somewhat opt optimistic about our opportunities. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next question might be one uh, I, might, I might ask for Katie. Um, and she's asked, and um, it's from Chow, and Chow's asked, is there any tips in terms of minimizing the erosion of margin of a product due to increased ingredient costs while still keeping competitive? So I think it's a question about how dealing with increased ingredient costs um, and, and still giving competitive pricing. Uh, Katie? Oh, there we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, it, that is very challenging. And the, the way that we deal with, with it is we we tend to build in as much margin as, as we can if we foresee that our ingredient costs are, are increasing. We are fortunate enough as a business to buy a lot of our ingredients within the UK so clearly some of our ingredients that we are importing for example fats and oils and, and things are and a lot of our inclusions the price has increased because of, of Brexit and that is that is certainly eroding our margin uh, but I guess we are somewhat cushioned from that blow because the, the vast majority of our ingredients are sourced within the UK or the bulk of it sourced within the UK. Um, we would tend to just build in enough margin. I know that's easier said than done, but working out uh, top down essentially from the retail price, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is just working from the retail price that you want to be at and working back building in as, and factoring in as much as you possibly can uh, in order to to hedge that uh, that issue that that's in practice that's how we do it um, but where you're looking at uh, where there's a you know a company with less margin to play with I realize that might be a bit bit of a challenge so I'm sorry that might be a bit of a <laughs> not very clear but I hope it helps a little bit. No, yeah, thank you, Katie. It was a really, really good answer, and um, it's always good to hear from someone who's kind of going through it at the same time. Um, we've had a question here from Ibet, who's trying to export Cadbury's chocolates to Peru, and one of the requirements they are asking for in Peru is, is uh, International Lab Labria Accreditation Corporation, and he's asking where he can find this, and I guess this also points to a question in terms of where are the good places to find the right documents and, inf and documents that you need to, to fulfill. Um, so, Susan, uh, are you able to answer that? Well, a good place to start for looking at what's required in each market and what, might, what documentation might be required is the market access database, which as long as you're within the European Union, you can access for free online. Uh, if you look at my slide under government fees, you'll find the link to it on that slide. That database has the uh, documentation requirements, the tariff requirements, 
uh, and many other requirements, but by product, as long as you have the right HS or tariff code for your product, then you can find out uh, a good overview of what's needed and where to get it. So that's a very good place to start. Thank you, Susan. And um, we're, we're starting to run out of time a little bit, so I'll ask one more question from Rob. And he asks, um, he's a small company and wants to test consumer acceptance of his product in India, um, but doesn't know any, any agents there at the moment. So he's thinking of using um, Fulfilled by Amazon India services in order to sell directly to con Indian consumers and then test for market. Um, so I guess the question here is kind of, uh, when pricing a product for online sales, what would you advise in terms of adding in for potential future agent costs if you're going to test the market without an agent first? Um, Do you want me to cover that? Yes, please do. Um, yes, I think, as I mentioned, when looking at that going direct to retail uh, slide, then I would do this very same if this is direct to consumer. So you obviously have Amazon's margin essentially as the, the retailer margin, but I would certainly build in for an import, uh, an importer distributor margin as well, so that you can you can cover that should you then go by an importer at a later date. I think it's important so that you do standardise the market price because otherwise you will leave yourself open to the importer looking to retail for the same amount but also for you to cover their margin. So it is important that you build that, build all that in. Um, and obviously, I'm assuming you'll, you'll have looked into all this, but India can be quite challenging in terms of uh, legislation for packaging and uh, requirements for net weights and MRPs etc sort of maximum retail price etc so there's quite a lot to factor in for for India which I'm, I'm sure you've, you've looked at but just in case then uh, there's there's quite a lot to cover for India okay thank you Katie um, and I think on that note, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. It's, 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 it's almost free. So, um, yeah, thank you once again to Susan, uh, Elsa and Katie for, for the answers there and also for the presentations. I think that was a really useful session, um, extremely topical as well. So, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Okay. I'd like to uh, remind everyone that you can continue to, to ask questions on our forum. We will be posting these questions um, onto the forum and assign them to your profile as well. So um, please do look out for responses in your email inbox. And if you'd like to withdraw your question in that process, please let us know as well. And don't forget to register and indeed attend our second food and drink webinar on Thursday, which will be on how to approach export documentation, something which we have touched upon today. We have Richard Collins from Ramsden International speaking on that session with Lorraine Holt from Whole Chambers of Commerce. Ramsden International are obviously a, a massive exporter selling a wide variety of products internationally, so they will have some really great experiences and there'll be some great advice in that session, I'm absolutely sure. You can also read more about food and drink exporting on our feature page, which, which contains loads of guides, case studies and events from the FDF and FDEA, um, so that's definitely worth looking into. That's all from us for now. Uh, please take our survey as you exit to let us know what you thought of the webinar and give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. Thanks for, thank you for attending and have a really good day. Goodbye.